Hey everyone, this is Divine. If you're new to this channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and share this video. We have a lot to talk about today, so let's get into it. Corinne Bailey Ray shot to stardom after the release of her self-titled debut album back in 2006. She's known worldwide for her gentle, soulful brand of musical style. Best known for hits like Put Your Records On and Just Like a Star, she has received multiple Grammy Award nominations and wins, becoming the fourth female British act in history to have their first album debut at number one on the music charts. Her first two albums combined have sold well over 5 million copies worldwide, but after experiencing a tragic loss, she took a hiatus from the music industry. What has she been up to since then? Corinne Jacqueline Bailey was born on February 26, 1979 in Leeds, England. She was raised in Moortown in the suburbs by her English mother, Linda, and her father, Chris, who's originally from St. Kitts. She is the eldest of three daughters. Her younger sister, Candace, is currently involved in politics, while the youngest, Rhea, also works in show business as an actress. She also has a large extended family. Her father has five siblings while her mother has three, and so she grew up surrounded by cousins, aunts, and grandparents who all live nearby. She remembers visiting her paternal grandparents, often at their home in Chapel Town. The family would gather there every Sunday where her grandmother would make delicious dishes from St. Kitts. They eventually moved back to St. Kitts to live in their dream home when she was about 16 years old. Growing up, family was always a priority. Her mother used to take her and her sisters to ballet classes, and on Saturdays, her father would take them to a music school where they learned to play the violin. Her mother loved to host parties at her home where they would do karaoke and dance. She had a decent childhood filled with fond memories, but there were some not so great moments as well. When she was about 12 years old, her parents divorced as their relationship just wasn't working anymore. Fortunately, they have managed to maintain an amicable relationship over the years, and on special occasions and holidays, they all gather to celebrate as a family. She first showed an interest in music while in school, where she studied classical violin before her attention turned to singing. At the age of 10, her mother, as she puts it, found religion. The entire family attended a Baptist church together, and she would play music during services on occasion as a young 13-year-old, leading the entire congregation. Corinne soon started singing in her Baptist church choir where she recorded two albums with the worship ministry youth group under the name Revive. During this time, her love for performing grew. The youth leader would encourage them to write their own songs and had them sing rewritten versions of songs by Scottish rock band Primal Scream during the worship segment at church in addition to traditional worship songs. She described her youth leader as a radical questioning guy who had a liberal and intellectual approach that the church didn't entirely approve of. He introduced her to Led Zeppelin, Radiohead and Bjork, playing a big role in her musical development early on. He even helped her to purchase her very first guitar. She went on to discover music by Lenny Kravitz and Jimi Hendrix, among others who influenced her musical style early on. At the age of 15, she formed her own indie group called Helen, whose style was inspired by musical acts like Veruca Salt and L7. Their music embodied very feminist ideologies. She loved artists like PJ Harvey and Courtney Love, whose sexuality had nothing to do with attracting male attention and everything to do with just expressing themselves. Helen did many local gigs, but didn't receive any attention from UK labels. However, US-based heavy metal record label Roadrunner Records home to artists like Slipknot, approached them in 1998. Their one shot at the big time fell through after the group's bassist got pregnant before the deal was even signed. Another group member also started experiencing stage fright around that same time. They soon disbanded, which devastated Bailey, understandably. She liked the idea of being at the forefront of something. It felt powerful and sexy to her, but as quickly as it came, it went. She was confused and unsure of how to move forward. Bob Miller, a local businessman who believed in her talent, encouraged her to pursue a solo career. She attended the University of Leeds where she studied English language and literature, graduating in 2000. At the age of 19, she started working part-time as a cloakroom attendant at a small local jazz club singing on occasion. She gradually found herself developing a love for soul and jazz music. 
This was where she met a charismatic Scotsman by the name of Jason Ray, a gifted jazz musician who played the saxophone for Haggis Horns and who would eventually work with the likes of Amy Winehouse and Mark Ronson, as well as Bailey herself. In interviews, she described him as funny and confident in a way that caused her to feel both intrigued and wary. He invited her to watch his band perform and she was amazed by their talent and passion for music. She knew at this point that her life was never going to be the same. He had a huge collection of jazz records as well as soul, hip hop, and funk music. He took great joy in exposing her to it all. In an interview, she gave him credit for her gradual evolution from grunge to the more soulful artist we know today. They got married in 2001 and she changed her name to Bailey Ray. Soon after her marriage, she started working on solo material, adopting a more soulful musical style. She met a local funk group, The New Master Sounds, and they collaborated on a track called Your Love Is Mine, which was featured on their 2000 three album, Be Yourself. The following year, she worked with another local group, Home Cut Directive, on the song Come the Revolution, which featured on their debut album. At this point, she was more than ready for some kind of breakthrough in her solo career, and this came in 2004. She was signed to Global Talent Publishing at the time, and soon after, she was approached by musician and record producer Mark Hill, who co-wrote and produced Craig David's multi-platinum debut album, Born to Do It. He is also a part of UK Garage duo Artful Dodger. He wanted her to appear on his new album, Better Lot Next Time, released under his alias, The Sticks. Their collaborative track, Young and Foolish, was released in April 2005 and was instrumental in bringing her to the attention of major record labels, with execs at EMI offering her a record deal. November 2005 saw the release of her debut single, Like a Star, and her self-titled debut album dropped in February of the following year. It debuted at the number one spot in the UK and peaked in the top five on the US Billboard 200, spending a total of 71 weeks on the chart. Like a Star became a big hit in both the UK and the US, selling over 327,000 in US downloads. Her follow-up single, Put Your Records On, would become her biggest hit to date, rising to the number two spot in the UK and selling over 945,000 US downloads. Music critics hailed her great first effort, naming her the number one predicted breakthrough act of 2006. In mid 2000 2006, she started her first international tour through Europe in North America with R&B singer John Legend. By April, her debut album was certified double platinum in the UK, and by December of that same year, it was certified platinum in the US. She won two Mobo Awards that year in the UK for Best UK Newcomer and Best UK Female. In July, she recorded a live session at Abbey Road Studios for the Live from Abbey Road series. She made several appearances on popular TV shows to promote her album. She received received three Grammy nominations for Record of the Year, Song of the Year, and Best New Artist in 2007. At the Grammy Awards that same year, she did a collaborative performance with John Legend and John Mayer, providing accompanying vocals for their respective tracks, Coming Home and Gravity. That same year, she recorded a cover of John Lennon's I'm Losing You for Making Some Noise, a musical venture organized by Amnesty International. Her cover was later featured on the 2007 John Lennon tribute album, Instant Karma, the the Amnesty International campaign to save Darfur. In 2008, Bailey Ray secured two Grammy wins for Album of the Year and Best Contemporary Jazz Album for her work on River, The Joni Letters, a tribute album by American jazz pianist Herbie Hancock. Like a Star was also nominated for Song of the Year. Things in her life and career seemed to finally be aligning in the way that she had always wanted. But just as she had achieved so much success in her music career, things are about to take a tragic turn in her personal life. On March 22nd, 2008, her husband was found dead in a flat in the Hyde Park area of Leeds at the age of just 31. She had been right in the middle of working on her sophomore album and suddenly her focus shifted in the most unimaginable way. In a 2009 interview, she described the moment she found out about his passing. She was in a taxi in Leeds when she received a phone call from the police informing her that they had been trying to contact her all day and that they needed to speak to her in person. According to the the coroner's report, Jason's death was as a result of an accidental overdose of methadone and alcohol. He had gone out for a drink with a friend, James Sheesby, and after several drinks, they left the pub and went to Sheesby's home. Jason drunkenly fell asleep on the couch while Sheesby went to bed early that Saturday morning. When he woke up in the late afternoon, he tried to wake Jason up, but he was unresponsive. He also found three empty bottles of methadone, which is a heroin substitute beside Jason's body. Now, Sheesby is a recovery 
recovering heroin addict and was prescribed methadone to aid in his rehabilitation. After a thorough investigation, the police determined that Sheesby had not given Jason the methadone. There were other drugs present in his system as well, but they did not contribute to his passing. Jason was deemed a naive user by the coroner and since he had no history of methadone abuse, it was classified as an accident. His passing hit Bailey Ray hard, especially because it could have been avoided and was as a result of a cruel twist of fate. She found herself in a very dark place trying to make sense of everything. She described Jason as an impulsive man. He liked to drink and have fun, but while he could be impulsive at times, he was also cautious in other ways. He wasn't a completely careless person and she knew that if he was here today, he would be very annoyed with himself. She felt like this was just a stupid drunken act that ended tragically. While it couldn't bring the love of her life back to her, the coroner's ruling did bring her some odd sense of comfort, but she was still left reeling from the pain of his loss. She lost the will to take care of even her most basic needs. Her mother, sisters, and a few friends temporarily moved in with her to provide her with love, support, and care. She couldn't even leave her apartment. She essentially took a break from music and from life in general. She felt like she had nothing to live for anymore. In an interview, she explained that a few months after his passing, she tried to record some songs that she had written, even going to a studio to meet with a producer. She thought at the time that if she just continued on business as usual, then everything would go back to normal. But she was still in shock over a sudden passing. Then she just disappeared from the music scene for a year. She didn't work on any new music, do any performances, go to the studio to record or write any songs. She just found herself sinking into a dark and destructive place while all around her, life just went on as usual. She struggled with thoughts of how she would go back to making music where she would have to deal with inevitable questions about her loss. A little over a year later, she gradually reintroduced herself to the music scene. She recorded some of the songs she had previously written and started writing new music as well. She did a few intimate performances and while working on her next album, she went at a pace that was more organic, allowing her to channel her grief into her music. The general feel of this album was quite a departure from the upbeat love songs of her debut album. She addressed darker feelings of sadness, grief, and loss as well, giving her sophomore album a more solemn feel while still celebrating her husband and their time together. In January 2010, she released her sophomore album, The Sea. By then, four years had passed since the release of her debut album, and it was almost two years since her husband's passing. Some of the songs featured in the album were written before her tragic loss and touched on her love for him, while others were written after his passing, addressing her grief. She recorded the album at Limefield Studio in Manchester in 2009, working with producers Steve Crescento and Steve Brown, who she had worked with on her debut album, as well as a host of session musicians who she was long familiar with from the local music scene. The album debuted at number five on the UK Albums Chart and was certified gold by the BPI in May 2010. In the US, it debuted at number seven on the Billboard 200, selling 53,000 copies in its first week. With the release of her sophomore album, she embarked on her second world tour, The Sea Tour, in February 2010. In the following year, she dropped an EP called The Love EP, which featured covers of popular love songs like Prince's I Wanna Be Your Lover, Bob Marley's Is This Love, and Paul McCartney and Wings' My Love. While it didn't produce any top 10 hits, the lead single Is This Love earned her first solo Grammy for Best R&B Performance. Compared to her sophomore album, The Love EP had a lighter sound and themes. That same year, she was a awarded an honorary doctorate degree by the University of Leeds. In 2013, she was moved from Capitol Records to Virgin Records due to their parent company being purchased by Universal Music Group in the previous year. Amidst all of that confusion, she was able to find moments of joy as she married her longtime producer and friend, Steve Brown, that same year. She never quite believed that she would find love again after the loss of her first husband, but while working together, they fell in love. She compared the process to the volume being turned up. They have two daughters together. She took a short break from music and then in May 2016, she released her third studio album, The Heart Speaks in Whispers. The album was co-produced by Bailey Ray and Steve Brown and debuted at number two on the Billboard R&B chart. It was clear that she was in a better place emotionally as this album had a lighter, hopeful feel. That same year, she was selected by NASA for the Destination Jupiter campaign when Juno spacecraft entered Jupiter's orbit on July the 4th and represented Europe for the international National Olympic Committee's PSA campaign. She has kept pretty busy with performances at various festivals in the UK and Europe. In 2017, she recorded a cover of Coldplay's The Cyanide.
Scientist, which was used in the opening title sequence for the film Fifty Shades Darker, which was released that February. The track was also featured on the movie's official soundtrack. One of her most recent projects was an original track she wrote for Tracy Ellis Ross's character, Grace Davis, in the film The High Note. She continues to work on new music and has been working on her fourth studio album. I'm curious to know what you guys think, so drop a comment down below. Don't forget to subscribe and share this video. Until next time.